Zone of the Enders was released back in 2001 towards the tail end of the PlayStation 2's launch window. It was developed by Konami Japan West, more specifically the division led by Hideo Kojima. Since Kojima himself was working on Metal Gear Solid 2 at the time, he took up more of an advisory role here, offering guidance to director Noriaki Okamura as his team set out to create a new type of mech game with an emphasis on speed and close quarters. The game ended up being bundled with a copy of the demo for Kojima's highly anticipated Metal Gear Solid sequel, which provided it with a big boost in initial sales. Even though I'm a big fan of the Metal Gear series and Kojima's other works, Zone of the Enders was something I'd been unable to play until the game was released for high-definition consoles in 2012. All footage captured for this review comes from the Xbox 360 version of the Zone of Enders HD Collection. The game is set in 2172 on a United Nations colony orbiting Jupiter, where a military group called Bahram has launched an attack with the express goal of stealing two advanced mecha known as Orbital Frames. You play as Leo Stenbuck. 13-year-old caught up in the battle who witnesses his friends getting murdered and then stumbles into the cockpit of a giant robot in the spirit of any mech anime. I detect that you are not the frame runner who was scheduled to pilot the orbital frame. No, I'm not. I just ran in here while trying to escape. After a brief tutorial with the frame's onboard AI, Leo pilots the Jehuti on a quest to protect the colony and escape with the precious orbital frame intact. As they fight, Leo and the AI, known as Ada, exchange awkward dialogue about the nature of killing, finding reasons to live, innocence, sacrifice, and other idealistic topics. As the tagline would suggest, fast-paced melee combat is paramount here. You don't have a huge amount of attacks, but they feel pretty comfortable and you'll get into a groove easily. Usually you'll want to boost in quick and then slide around the enemy to hit him with a powerful attack. Projectile weapons can either be quick and weak to be used while you boost around the enemy, or powerful charge attacks that can take care of enemies that are too far away very easily. I can imagine that this kind of fluid combat was probably a big deal back in the launch days of the PS2, as I don't really remember too many games before then that could do something like that on that level of technology. Unfortunately, since you have everything you need to be good at the beginning of the game, the combat can get fairly repetitive after a while. This isn't helped by the fact that there's only three enemy types in the entire game. Strategies for dealing with them aren't all that different, and that applies to the bosses as well. Just strife around and keep using boost attacks, and when their weak points exposed, just use drive attacks. There are sub-weapons which can be collected and used to complement your regular attacks, but most of them are only of use in very specific circumstances and aren't actually all that great at hurting enemies any quicker than you would normally. Plus, switching through the many weapons with the D-pad is cumbersome in the middle of a fight, and if you're too close to an enemy, you'll accidentally grab them, since sub-weapons and the grab move both use the same button. The big exception here is Gauntlet, which is way too powerful and can be spammed over and over again to quickly kill enemies, and even bosses. For the most part, the game plays like this. You go into an area, you see enemy squads, one of them has a passcode, you kill them to get the code, and then you use it on a terminal to unlock some kind of key item or a new sub-weapon. There's a handful of optional levels where you're graded on how many buildings and civilian shelters are destroyed as you fight. It's a challenge enough to limit your own collateral during a skirmish. Enemy squads will attack buildings randomly though when you're not in combat with them, and that can lock you out of certain ranks literally seconds into a mission. There really wasn't anything you could have done about that. Fortunately, you can't really get the lowest rank unless you go out of your way to destroy everything. There's no reward for getting the best ranks on these missions, so the real reward is just any sub-weapons that might happen to be hidden away in these levels. I think it would have been a lot more interesting to have these civilian areas appear scattered throughout regular levels than being all concentrated into a few gimmicky stages, as it certainly would have added a lot more variety throughout the entire game. The game also contains an experience bar, which goes up every time you kill an enemy. When you level up, your sword attacks do more damage. Since the enemy robots get stronger as you progress through the game anyway, I thought that this was kind of an odd inclusion. On hard difficulty or above, you lose experience points any time that you destroy a building. That's an interesting dynamic, and it could have gone a long way in terms of making players care about keeping the colony intact. However, since it's just hidden behind some difficulty walls, most players aren't going to experience it on their first time. Despite the pedigree of Kojima's team, Zoe's script and voice acting are a sharp step down from Metal Gear Solid. I suspect that not as much care was put into the localization, as many stilted lines seem like the result of poor translations. 
You embarrassed me this time, so look forward to the next time. The mission is to transport this Jehuti to Mars in preparation for a battle on Mars. Salvis! That is you! Isn't it, Salvis? Are you all right, Salvis? Leo? That frame's not a kid's toy. Get out of there now! I'm not a kid! There's the proof that you still are a kid. What? So be careful. I know, but at least I have to exterminate the enemy in this area. Why do you do such terrible things? I don't know. That's why Alan, one of your colleagues, had to die. Alan was Elena's boyfriend, and my best friend. Time to settle our fight. Come to Spaceport. I'll be waiting. Even so, the actors don't put much emotion into their performances, especially our main character. I got the impression that he was supposed to have bratty qualities at the beginning of the story, and then grow out of them towards the end. But thanks to bad acting, he just ends up unlikable the whole way through. You are the only one who can save the colony. No! I don't want to do that. Leo, listen to me. You go find them. I don't want to get involved anymore. I've had enough. Why me? Why always me? The character design is also a bit underwhelming. They have a very stock anime look to them without all that much detail. You could probably put them in any PS2 game from the era, and I wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. Fortunately, you don't see them too much, but any emotion you're supposed to get from their expressions at cutscenes is somewhat lost thanks to awkward facial animation and limited dubbing. I've been alone since I was a boy. My father and mother were rarely at home. We hardly went out anywhere together. When it comes to the mech designs, Yoji Shinkawa did a great job coming up with a fresh new take for them. Jehuti in particular looks very nimble, and you can tell right off the bat that its speed is a far more important asset than its firepower. He even decided to put the cockpits on the groin area, which was probably done for some really thematic reason and not as a schoolboy joke. Fans of the mecha genre would probably be left wanting by how sparse the universe of Zone of the Enders is. Interviews with director Okamura reveal that he had definite answers for the nature of the conflict between Earth and Mars, but barely any of that information is present within the game itself, which just leaves things vague and uninteresting as a result. The war between the United Nations Space Force and Barum was originally supposed to have elements of interplanetary colonialism and even racism. The only thing that remains of that element is that Leo is called an Ender in the first cutscene, referring to the fact that he lives on Jupiter, the end of civilized space. Considering that that word's in the title, the story probably should have had more to do with that. Although to be honest, since the game's translation turned out to be very poor, I'm glad that they didn't choose to tackle those themes because I don't think they would have been done justice. As it stands, the game is just about some vague bad guys who fight some vague good guys. Important plot details like what exactly Barum is, and the fact that the orbital frames they're going after were stolen from them in the first place aren't actually mentioned anywhere in the game. I wasn't aware of those details until I read the manual for the sequel, believe it or not. Now for the real problem. My playthroughs of Zone of the Enders clock in at around three and a half hours, and that includes the hour or so of cinematics. While I do think that there are some people who obsess a bit too much over the exact hours of a game's length relative to its cost, I certainly don't think I would have been happy with a game this short if I spent the full 50 bucks on it back in 2001. Most games I played back then had way more replay value. When I compare Zoe to other games with very short lengths, those games try to pack each level with a lot of variety to make them all more memorable. And Zoe doesn't attempt to do that instead containing many sequences that just appear to exist only so that the length can be extended. Interestingly enough, there's actually an alternate bad ending that can be triggered by getting the lowest rank or not attempting any of the side missions, and the game just abruptly ends after the second boss fight and boots you back to the title screen. Why they decided to make a really short game even shorter is beyond me, especially since you do have to go out of your way to fail these levels. There are many points throughout the game where some kind of sudden obstruction will force the player to return to earlier areas to find new items that'll let them make progress. This type of thing's been done in all sorts of games to great success, but this isn't the case. It's just pointless padding. For instance, you'll arrive at a power relay that needs to be destroyed, but Ada will inform you that you need a new type of weapon to penetrate its defenses. You're not told what you need or where it can be found other than that it's somewhere else. Since this is early in the game, there's only a few places that you can check. 
but as you go farther you'll be required to backtrack again and again and they don't tell you where to go as the areas keep increasing. To make matters worse, the sniper subweapon that you get for this solution happens to reside in the exact same spot where another item is 45 minutes later in the game. That's right, you're meant to backtrack to the same exact spot twice. A much more natural solution here would have been for the player to go to a new map before reaching the power relay where they happen to acquire the sniper weapon. This wouldn't take any longer than the way it is currently, but it would certainly help the player feel like they're actually making progress. The most frustrating thing about this backtracking for items is that, unlike the sniper subweapon, most of them aren't really used for anything. For instance, you can't target cloaked enemies, and you need to destroy a cloaked enemy to get a password, but you have to go all the way back and find a program that lets you target cloaked enemies. Those are the only enemies in the entire game that have a cloak. It's not of any use after that point. If that's not padding, I don't know what is. I get the sense that the development team probably wanted to make the most out of the areas that they designed, which could explain all of the repeat trips to them. But since the rescue missions are an odd fit, there's no reason that those couldn't have just been made mandatory and housed the relevant key items instead. While we're at it, they probably should have spaced the boss battles out a bit better, because you more or less end up fighting four of them in a row at the end. At the tail end of the game, things start to get a little more unique, but ultimately it was a bit too little too late. The last real level is more linear than the rest of the game, it has you fighting a lot of enemies, but it's a bit too accommodating because it gives you a ton of resupplies throughout. There's even a sub-weapon that restores your health, which can make the boss sandwich coming up easier than it should have been. Then comes a cutscene that I'm fairly certain is supposed to be the emotional high point for the game's story, but it just amounts to an awful melodrama instead. We really don't know much about these characters, they're flat and uninteresting, they're trying way too hard to make you feel anything based on what's going on, and it gets even worse when you confront the final boss, and she spends four minutes trying to make you feel very bad for her, even though she's just been a generic evil person the entire game. I have lost everything. I survived many battles. I lost my parents and my lover. I don't have the functions of a woman now. It actually reminds me an awful lot of Sniper Wolf's death scene in the original Metal Gear Solid. I finally understand. I wasn't waiting to kill people. I was waiting for someone to kill me. I feel like they were trying to use that as a base, whereas that scene worked pretty well because of the relationship between Snake and Otacon. All we have to work with here is a bratty kid and an emotionless robot. Certainly not getting invested in that. Okay, I should be honest, she's not technically the final boss, but it would have been better if she was because the real final boss is extremely underwhelming and disappointing. Leo may have been able to protect Jehuti from Bahram, but their leader was able to get his hands on the other orbital frame known as Anubis. Unfortunately, there isn't really a boss fight here. Just dodge his attacks for a little while, and then you're saved via cutscene. You know, if you're making a video game that's going to be on the short side, you should really try to make sure that it isn't anticlimactic. The final cutscene ultimately left me on a sour note because it introduced what could have been a good plot twist only minutes before the game was over. Jehuti's duty on Mars is to penetrate the military fortress Alman and to destroy the fortress from the inside by self-destructing Jehuti. I thought it was you who told me not to waste my life! Pressurization is complete. Opening the hatch. Thank you. I mean, it isn't like I don't understand the irony of what's happening here. Leo didn't believe that his life had any value and was more than willing to throw it away until he was convinced otherwise in part by Ada and found new purpose fighting against Bahram. So then Ada's claim that her entire purpose is to sacrifice her own life is a clear contradiction. The thing is, this isn't an existentialist short story. It's a video game. We kind of need more to go off here. The cutscene can't be weird and anticlimactic if the boss battle also was. I mean, even though I kind of hate this kid, I still want to know what he's going to do. Is he going to try to go to Mars and fight like she wants? Is he going to stop her and betray his new allies in the process? I guess the game doesn't think it matters. Roll credits. Overall, I'd say that the big root cause for Zone of the Enders problems is just that it's an early console gen game. The team clearly had a fresh new idea with all this new tech behind it, but I just don't think that they were really able to take that idea and create a full game around it. 
The core mechanics are fun and well-tuned, because that was the new idea, but when it comes to structuring the flow of the game and side mechanics that are just as interesting and thought out, and the story, I just don't think that they could really figure out what to do. And they were definitely motivated, it's not a heartless game, it has soul to it, but it is an early-gen launch title. So, it's probably just a case of time constraints. It was rushed. I mentioned earlier that there was a sequel to this game, and it's way better. Probably worth doing an entirely separate video on. Unfortunately, it didn't really sell as well, so Konami didn't go any further with the series, which is disappointing because I think they really nailed the concept on the second try. Given how awesome some character action games look on today's consoles, you have to wonder what Zoe might have been like if it had ever made it that far. So unfortunately, I think the legacy of Zone of the Enders is one of those one-console gems. You know, the kind of game that was a lot of fun at the time, but they never seemed to be able to make the jump to a new console generation. If you asked me to recommend the Zone of the Enders collection to you, I wouldn't recommend it off the strength of it as a two-game package, because the first game really just doesn't have much to offer. Any drive you'd have to get it would be entirely off of the sequel. I probably should have just done a video about the second game. Why didn't I do that? Okay, here's a better recommendation. If you like giant robot stuff, if you like character action, if you're interested in seeing like an early PS2 fusion of those things, go ahead and buy this game. Or if you just want to see what it was like when Konami was actually making video games and not just sitting in the fetal position ignoring the entire industry, you might want to try this as well. Just don't complain to me if you didn't like the first game, and I warned you. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a guru or a know everything about video games, I have all the answers kind of person. That's not me. This is just one man's thoughts on some kind of obscure PS2 game, alright? Shut up! Shut up!